Um, yeah. Miles, what did you mean exactly with lies? You mean uh, these political games being played between different countries? Did I understand you correctly? Yeah, and I mean, it's, I mean, from from my perspective, I mean, from my perspective of, of Afghanistan, and I mean, it's like, it's like, what, it's like you look at it, and it's like, well, why did we do this? Well, what, what was the point? My patrol base got overran. Helmand Province is just as dangerous as it was then. Well, well, what did we do? All the police we trained, half of them are dead. All the commanders are dead. What was the point? Like, Afghanistan is still in a horrible condition doing with Pakistan and ISI and all this political stuff. But at the time, you know, in, 19, in 2010, it's this very noble cause and, you know, a war against terrorism, or we're going to go do this and da-da-da and everything. And then, and then you look at, I mean, we look at Iraq. It's like, why did that have to happen? It didn't have to happen. That was such, it was such a waste of life and destruction and everything. Like, why? <laughs> it was unnecessary, you know? And then we, we even go back, we go back to Iran, Iraq, right? With your country in the 1980s. It's like, why? why? Why did this destructive thing where like, like the U.S. and all these countries like face these two countries off against each other? And what, what why? What, what was the point? It was just this political game of chess that everyone else gets caught in the middle of, you know? And, that, and that's like, that's like the sort of, like, I mean, as an older person, you look at you look back at that and it's like, what was the point? Why do we do this? You know, and that's that's a point actually. That some of the most some as as I grow older, as I grow older, some of the more fascinating stories of warfare to me are actually when people come together and afterwards, and then veterans talk and they come together and they're and they and they have these conversations and like, why were we doing that? We're just human beings at the end of the day. You know, and I think one of those, there's, there's, there's this beautiful tale of, um, in the Six Day War, 1967, of uh, the Battle for Jerusalem, of Ammunition Hill, and the IDF, the, the 55th Paratrooper Brigade, is fighting against um, uh, the Jordanian um, infantry that was there. There's a big fight in the dark, boom, 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 um, and the IDF took it over, blah, blah, blah. But in the 1990s, there's an event actually organized when Israel and Jordan in the 2000s, you know, had better relations. And there's this really awesome article where um, you have the IDF paratroopers on the hill, on the anniversary of the hill, and then they got some of the Jordanian veterans. And you have this description of the talk, and the two guys are, the guys are talking to each other, and the, the Jordanian guy is like, oh, yeah, I was in this machine gun position, and I saw you guys coming from here, and the IDF guy was like, yeah, yeah, we came up this way. The Jordanian is like, oh, yeah, I, I killed your buddy over here. I remember that. And the IDF guy's like, yeah, his name was like Ramon or something. And da, da, da. And then they take out their phones and they're showing each other pictures of their grandkids. And they're like, hey, look, look, look at my grandkids. And, you know, look what my family is doing today. And you get this sort of, you know, this sort of gist of the conversation of, well, what were we doing that for? Like, we're just, we're just humans at the end of the day. It's like, we're just old men with these families now. It's like, why? Why do we go through all that? You know? I don't know. These are more like philosophical kind of things in terms of looking at like, well, what, what was the uh, point? And, you know, and that kind of deal. You know, Miles, uh, when we, in a teaching ethical leadership or ethics in general, it's said that we human beings, actually we are ethical in our nature, no matter where all come from. And Based on that, we are programmed to support each other because life is hard, as you said it. Civilian life is hard, as you said it, right? You have to do this. Many things are happening. So we are programmed to help each other. Um, we are talking about healthy human beings, right, in the mind, right? You understand. I'm not talking about someone who's suffering from psychological disease. That's not what I'm talking. Healthy human being. We are not programmed to kill each other. And if we do, then sufferings happen. That's part of ethical leadership, right? You know, and then when you were talking about that, I, I, I understand what you're saying, right? And then, uh, yes, all, all, I mean, all these things. And, you know, and sadly, we, I was talking to, I mean, and it's very important this talk for me, for me, because you know, sadly, you know, you see that Bob Brooks, he's a very experienced uh, 
uh, and structure of swordsmanship, European one in uh, and fencing in um, historical fencing in the United Kingdom in England. And he was telling me there are so many people now, young guys who come into martial arts and then they say, talk about killing, talk about these things. And these people have no clue, right? What martial arts are all about, right? And I think your words mean a lot, especially for these young guys or kids, if I may say so, who say things like that. Because, you know, I was talking to Bob. I mean, he's going to go on our channel and he was really sad about this development among some young people, right? In martial arts scene to talk like that because it's, it's not the whole idea of martial arts, right? No matter how tough you think you are or your martial art is, right? And um, so that's the reason when, when you said it, it's very interesting what you mentioned and very valuable lesson actually coming from the from you from as an experienced combat veteran and a US Marine Corps uh, and a member, right? A soldier, infantry soldier. Um, yeah. And um, when you go on a deployment, I mean, but you were in Helmand, and then um, could you just tell us about the nature there? How is the nature there? Is it like... Uh, in, ter in terms of the weather, the local yes. environment, the people, the All operating, operation tempo. Yes. Everything you can tell us. Um, I, I, wow. I mean, it's very unforgiving. The nights can be very cold. The days are very hot. I mean, examples that I always like to talk about is, you know, I, I would have envelopes and I would like fold an envelope to send in the mail back to the U.S. And like, like 10 minutes later, the glue on the envelope has is, is melted because it's so hot. And now the flap needs to be taped down because there's no more glue on the inside, right? Because it's just it's like just, just a little like tidbit. Um, and I mean... In, in Helmand, in the summer months, wow, the heat is, the humidity especially, and especially on our patrols, we'd be walking through um, fields and farmer's fields, and then the mud would stick it to your boots, and you're walking and just drenched, absolutely drenched in sweat. Your entire outfit, your flat, not, I say outfit, I mean, it's like your uniform, your your plate carrier, your helmet, even the like the cloth on your helmet, your entire uniform, your entire outfit is just drenched, absolutely drenched in sweat, and there's nothing you can do. And that was just a daily thing. So it was very unforgiving, right? Um, the Taliban was very unforgiving. The enemy was a very determined, very smart enemy. They knew, you know, they they were not stupid. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing in terms of how to maneuver, in terms of how to be covert about where to shoot from and where to move to, in terms of bombs, in terms of you know the cat and mouse game with the bombs. Um, I will say though that as as smart as the Taliban were with IEDs and and uh, bomb making materials, um, very ingenuitive and very forward thinking and very um, you know. They would do something and then we would figure out a countermeasure and then they would do something that would make that countermeasure obsolete the next day, right? And as, as good as the Taliban were in that respect, ISIS in Syria and Iraq went 10 times further in terms of the technological advantages, in terms of um, the application and the theory of what they did. ISIS was way better in terms of what I've seen to the point of this is super scary. What the Taliban did was scary. What ISIS did was beyond scary. Very much, this is almost an impossible um, fight to go against. Um, but that's, and that gets more in terms of you know um, the, the technology and of the enemy and how does the enemy work. Um, but in, and then in terms of um, um, the people and working with the Afghans, whether it's the Afghan army or the Afghan police or working with villagers. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes you have good experiences, sometimes you have horrible experiences, bad cultural experiences, bad problems in um, translation, problems in misunderstanding. I mean, I mean, one very, you know, very poignant memory I have of mine is, um, you know, going to a vantage point over a village and trying to get a good security position so I can look over the village to see if, you know, anyone's coming up on us. 
and one of the um, Afghan policemen being furious to the point of, you know, wanting to almost shoot me off of this mound. Um, and my, our interpreter said, Miles, you got to get off that mound right now. And I was like, why? You know, and it was a hundred, this is an example of this is a hundred percent um, tactically correct decision that it's at the same time, a hundred percent culturally wrong, you know, because, because rural Pashtuns, you have these villages and you have these open courtyards. And if you're in a vantage point above a village, now you're looking into the privacy where all the women are wearing no burqas and the kids are running around and you're looking into the privacy of their homes. And that policeman was furious that I had the nerve to, you know, do that. I wasn't thinking about, I wasn't thinking about finding a burqa, you know, that was laying around. I was thinking about providing an overwatch position. But that's some of just the weird intricacies of stuff. And you have this friction with the Afghan police and Afghan army and the issue of Bachabazi. I mean, it's, very, it's unforgiving in that, in that aspect, both the human terrain and the physical terrain. And, the, and I mean, just from, you know, from the physical terrain aspect, you're going on 10, 15 kilometer patrols. And as I said earlier, you're drenched in sweat. Your boots are sucking up the mud from the field because you can't walk on the road because the road might have bombs on it. And then you walk through a cornfield and you're drenched in even more sweat. Now you're running out of water. And, um, you know, you're dealing with the people and they're making funny faces at you. And then you're wondering, am I going to get shot at from here or not? And then your vehicles are breaking down and the terrain just, it's, it's an arid desert environment in many cases. And that environment um, ruins equipment, ruins, it, it causes friction, the sand gets in everywhere, your vehicles break down. Um, faster than they would in an environment that was a more temperate climate, for example. I mean, rubber wears down, lanyards break, um, you know, vehicle connections and stuff like that goes haywire. Um, so it's, it's an interesting environment in that respect. Sunsets, sunsets were fantastic, I'll tell you that. How, I mean, when in the night it's really cold, you said, so it's like a desert cold, right? Can I say that? That is that cold? Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. And especially in the winter months, desert cold. Yeah. So it's, it's not that, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it's not that it's, you know, so it's below freezing, but compared to what you were dealing with in the day, it's colder. It's way colder. So you're, you know, you're, you're, you're it's, it's so you're dealing with really extreme temperatures in the day and then on the low end at night. And so you have to do this like jumble from really hot to really cold um, on a daily basis, you know, and you're living and you're living in those vehicles, you're sleeping on the ground and with that, with that kind of thing. I loved it. I, I honestly, those, those are, those are some of the best days of my youth. Um, I loved being deployed. I loved, I loved the province I was in. I loved I loved Loy Calais, the village outside there. Um, I loved it. It was it was some of the best things I've ever done. Um, despite all these weird problems that I described, I absolutely loved it. Um, does the region have water problems? I mean, do they have enough water there, or is it like water shortage there? There is there is dealing with water in Helmand Province is. Like a lot of the farmers are straight up magicians, the way they work with water. Um, they'll dig these canals and they'll actually, it's really cool to watch actually because you've got the Helmand River and you actually have a bunch of um, uh, irrigation projects. They were actually built by the US Army Corps of Engineers in the 1950s um, as part of that Cold War jostling between the US and Soviet Union. Um, Corps of Engineers actually built a bunch of irrigation projects in Helmand Province. And um, so you've got a lot of pre-dug canals and irrigation ditches, but the farmers actually do things like channel the water out and they'll actually spend all day, you know, digging a ditch, a small channel, and then they'll open it up and then that will open up water to this part of the field because they're starting in. It's really cool. But yeah, water, water management there is of utmost importance to all the people there because you have this very narrow strip within Helmand Province within the river um, and that, that where the water is flowing out and you only have about 
maybe five to 10 kilometers east and west of either side of the river, um, that's green, known as the green zone um, in, our, in our term of that time. And beyond the green zone, it's just nothing. It's just desert. We'll have some isolated, maybe a village or a house or a hut or two kind of thing as a family lives here or there, but that's it. And then you'll have um, 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 the, the, the wandering caravan um, that would go around the, the, what were they? Oh, they started with a B. Why am I, why am I blanking on their name? Um, uh, Coochies. Coochies. They were the Coochie tribesmen. And they would, they, would, they would run around and they would be on their camels and they'd come with their sheep and then they'd be migratory. Um, and those were always really fascinating to see because they weren't Pashtun, they were Kuchi. And, you know, their women would be dressed different, differently and their men would be different. They'd set up these like camps on the river and they, they'd kind of migrate through an area for, for a couple of weeks and then go somewhere else. And, you know, that would always be, that would always, um, you know, be kind of funny to, to run into because you're on... You're on a night patrol and, you know, it's like, it's funny to think about it now, you know, but we're on a night patrol and you know, we've got our night vision goggles down and we've got our light mirror machine guns and our rifles, you know, we're ready for contact and we're moving down this road, trying to be stealthy and stuff and boom, you bump into a herd, a herd of maybe 50 or 100 sheep and you have these coochies and you have these, you know, coochie shepherds that are kind of looking at you. And they've kind of got their, their, you know, their staff, they're kind of waving them at you. And they're kind of like, get your stupid American tactical patrol out of the way of my sheep, because I've got to get these sheep 50 meters that way, because I got to go to sleep over there. And we're just over sorry, like, you know, walking through the sheep kind of thing. So, you know, it's just kind of funny to think about those kinds of things. But that's the kind of stuff you deal with. And it's like, oh, the coochies are back in town again. Now we have to patrol through their herds of sheep. Well, at least there's no, and you know, we were like, well, at least there's no IEDs or bombs on the road because the sheep would have set them off. So we're happy that we're safe to go that way. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. So they, they just migrate all the time, right? These, what you talked about. There is a set periods of the year. Um, either the time that I would, I mean, the time that I was there, they came for like three weeks or two weeks. And that was it. We never saw them again because they migrated somewhere else. And that was part of their, their cycle. And, you know, they came they from the south to the north or the north to the south. I, I forget. But, I mean, it was, you know, one day it's like, oh, oh who, are the, who are these weird people walking down the road? Oh, there's a coochie. And then, like, oh, we see them for two weeks. And we have to walk through their sheep. And then when they're gone. Um, so now it's just an aspect of operating among there. So. Okay. Miles, at the end of our talk today, what is the main message of your book? What can you tell our uh, our viewers about the main message of you of your book? I think the I think for me the most important for me personally the most important message is uh, that of Kevin Tron um, because he killed himself in September of 2015 and. To me, if anything, it's, it's important for me to get Kevin's story out and get Kevin's name out and Kevin's for Kevin's family and more, most especially Kevin's widow, um, a lady named Abby, who's since been remarried, but she keeps Kevin's memory alive. Um, and, and the book is a way of doing that because the book is a way of, you know, putting down, because um, so, so many guys from my battalion have killed themselves, um, at least over two dozen um, from my generation. From what I've been in, and Kevin is one of them, and um, it's important for me to say, look, you know, Kevin's name is in the record forever. You know, as long as there's an internet or you know there's published material, you'll see, you know, into Hellman with the Walking Dead, Miles Vining, and Kevin Schron, and you know, Kevin won't be forgotten in that aspect. Miles, That's the first most important thing for me. Oh yes, Miles, may I ask why he committed suicide? Why did he do that? Yeah, Kevin, um, Kevin was dealing with personal, with a lot of personal stuff that went far beyond. And this is something I always like to stress about, well, veterans and veteran suicide in the United States. I can't, I can't speak for veteran suicide outside the United States. I mean, I think that's a fascinating topic in and of itself. Um, 
but in the United States, um, Kevin, Kevin was going through a lot of stuff that was se- a lot of it, which was separate from his service in the Marines. Um, and that's the thing, you know, Kevin was a very strong individual, very, very um, happy, very well rooted. He, he was, he was a machine gunner, right? Um, and he knew, he knew how to work at 240, he knew how to work in M2. He was a very good machine gunner as well. He loved being a machine gunner. He loved combat. He loved the Marines. He loved being in the infantry and he loved doing his job. All right. So when it comes to combat, you know, Kevin didn't, Kevin wasn't involved in combat and he had some traumatic experience because of combat. And, you know, he felt like taking his life afterwards. It was quite the opposite. He loved combat. Combat was one of the best things, you know, he'd ever partaken into. He got to do his dream job of being in the infantry and being a machine gunner. You know, when he was, you know, in his job, he envisioned himself and he mentioned, you know, the Battle of Kursk. He was big into World War II German history. And, he, you know, I'm sure he was thinking of, you know, com- comparing himself to um, a U.S. Marine machine gunner in 2013 um, eerily very similar to what a German MG-34 machine gunner would have been doing in 1941. We have very similar jobs. You know, he's seeing himself in that historical role as, you know, trying to, and again, trying to compare, right? Okay, well, what did those guys go through? I want to go through what they did, you know, kind of thing. Um, but what he went through in terms of personally, that was a, that's a very complex battle that in terms of social issues and all kinds of other stuff. He was happily married. He had a awesome wife you know abby they lived in uh, ohio he was going to school he had the gi bill um he was financially set you know he was marriage wife marriage wise was set i was talking to him he was perfectly fine you know going on about stuff um and then and then you know all the blue because he was dealing with stuff that he didn't want to talk about that has that went way beyond his uh service in the marines out of the blue you know just boom you know killed himself um, shot himself in the head in Ohio. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, and this was the first uh, message of your book, uh, quite uh, shocking what you said. And then what is the next message of your book you want to uh, share with uh, readers of your book, please? I think, I think the biggest thing is that of uh, trying to convey the story of, you know, this is, Um, This is our experience. I can't speak for everyone, but this is sort of our testimony. This is sort of our testimony to what being a young man is and in being in combat and um, being in the service and trying to live up to expectations bigger than yourself and dealing with issues of love and um, breakup and, you know, sorrow and getting out and trying to find your place in the world. I think that is, that's the sort of, number two thing that we want to have our sort of testimony um in that in that regard um for that for that matter um and and sort of the caveat off of that to just to try to show this aspect of you know this get get beyond the get beyond the politics of you know okay the, the war and the fight or was it worthy or was it not I don't know. I can't control any of that. I don't know if it was worth it. I don't know what we did was, was the right thing or the wrong thing. I don't know. But what I know is that I wanted to be in a fight and that's what I got. And that's what it was like. Um, the politics are different. I don't know. Read, you know, read some political book in Afghanistan for that matter. It's like, I don't know. You're not, you're not going to find that. You're not going to find that in this book. It's not there. So, yeah. It is like always the same thing, right? It reminds me of, uh, no, I don't know if, but I'm going to say it anyhow. You know, it's just like a redundancy planning. If you sit in a board of a company, you are just dealing with redundancy planning. That's tough game and uh, people can go and find new jobs. But you do not realize that people do not all come from the same backgrounds as you come from, from the right family. So you sit on a board of a company making millions and then all of a sudden make thousands of people redundant. And then you just say they need to be flexible. 
but how they can be flexible to find a new job for the kids in the market. You basically don't care. Business is tough, right? Tough. Yeah. You know, I really, I, you know, I say it now on this channel uh, because I work also in the field, you know, that as also as a consultant, also as a teaching at business administration, you know, when people say business is tough, it's always funny to me as a black belt in bare knuckle Kyokushin or as a guy who comes from different full contact arts or also in uh, weapons without weapons, I always ask myself, what does he talk, what is he talking about, Miles, right? And then tough, all right. So the same thing, you know, it's like some people talk about strategic games or uh, the grand chessboard, but in order to play the grand chessboard or chessboard worldwide, they send guys like you to play their game of chessboard. And the same thing is, <laughs> the same thing is done in civilian life with no difference in my opinion. You know, and I just say to you, and very openly, I'm a, and I'm an academic and need to be careful, but I don't mind anymore to be, I don't care. And I just say to you, you know, deploying people like you, right? And with this comes with, this with, with this, it comes with responsibility. As you said, and which I find extremely beautiful what you said, that at the end of the day, when veterans from both sides come, they're older, they share experiences, then you ask yourself, or after you see, after your deployment, nothing has changed, and you keep asking, why did we do that? The same thing comes, you know, when you come from this board, that board, and you make so many people redundant, they lose their jobs. And then at the end of the day, you say that's the necessity of the business. You know, I'm not so sure about all these things. Because I always say, sir, it was your grand chessboard, but on the, at the end of it, young men were dying because of your strategic games, right? Or the same thing for companies. I say, it was your, you know, let's say saving company or shareholders money, but you made so many people unemployed. And you know that we know that minds, what happens to people, families, when the father or mom, they lose their jobs, what happens to kids, what can happen to the whole family? No one cares, right? So, and then you said that, which, which I also find very beautiful, and that civilian life is also tough, right? Many people also always think it's only the battlefield which is hard. But civilian life, you know, paying this, paying that bill, all these games, all these politics, all these things is also tough, right? And then you can see then again parallels, right? How the different battlefields are fought. And that's why your experiences are very, very uh, valuable or invaluable, actually, for us. Very, very much so for all viewers of this channel who watched this channel. And uh, thank you for sharing this for you. And uh, it's very, really shocking to see that because you, both of you wrote this book and one of you is not there anymore. And your experience is in uh, Afghanistan. And still, I really need to... Uh, say something about you. We have, we have known each other for uh, quite now, a couple of weeks, maybe months. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry, my memory. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what, what I really like about you is that in spite of um, having experienced all these things, your high spirits, your positive attitude, which is very beautiful to watch and to see uh, for me. So thank you, uh, Miles, for sharing this. And your book can be bought in Amazon and also from your website. So we are going to link them here on our, uh, uh, you know, in the descriptions of this video, my guys are going to link it, right? So, yeah, so do you, would you like at the end of our discussion to share something else with our uh, viewers, Miles? Um, this, this, is a, this is such an honor and it's just so awesome to, to talk with you about this. It's just such an honor to be invited. And, um, it's really an honor to talk about Kevin uh, and to get, talk about him and get his name out there um, and with this kind of thing and about that. And it's just, uh, yeah, no, I really appreciate it. Um, the honor is all mine and Kevin. Thank you very much, Mize. So I, again, thank you very much. And uh, I wish you a nice day. And we are going to 
a while, uh, I mean, to do other things together, to do research, because I know that Myers also loves doing research on firearms, historical firearms, and they're going to work different projects in historical firearm analysis, matchlocks, flintlocks, percussion caps, or whatever <laughs> in that area, right? Very good. Thank you very much, and uh, have a nice day, Myers. Thank you.